Okay, so now we're going to start um, our session on measurement. And I think this is going to tie in really well with Mercedes talk. So kind of Mercedes talk really uncovered the important role of this sort of supply chain services sector of the economy. And I think I've got a bit of knowledge about the upcoming papers. They're also going to stumble across this, um, this sort of economic phenomena due to the supply chain services sector in, in various ways. So I'll, we'll uh, bring on Anna Valero from the LSE. She's going to present Economic go Growth Goes Fractal, the changing structure of uh, innovative firms in the UK. Right, Anna? Okay. Okay. You've got 15 minutes, Anna. I know I've got a stopwatch. Thank you. Um, great. So thanks very much, Michael. And this is work that we are doing together with a great team funded by an ESRC um, project, the Future Tech Project, where we basically obtained a number of data sets which are web-based data on firms to try and understand and map the emerging technologies in the UK. Um, I want to thank in particular Viet and Juliana, two members of the team who have contributed a lot to this particular project within this wider project. Um, and this is also the first time we're presenting this piece. So we very much welcome ideas and comments as we complete our working paper on it. So to give you an overview of what we're doing here, we're going to be studying the structure of the UK's high growth economy. Um, and we're going to be doing this using quite comprehensive data on firm financials, standard kind of financial data, but also firm activities that are relevant when we're thinking about the high growth economy um, and text data on what they're doing. So we're going to create measures of textual similarity between firms, which are going to enable us to locate them in clusters and kind of competitive networks. And we're really building here on a paper by Hoberg and Phillips. So it's this kind of text based network industries kind of idea. Um, and some other papers that have compared um, the strategic positioning of different firms, often large firms in the US, but also another paper that's looked at startups versus those larger incumbents. And then once we've got various measures of kind of similarity or um, relationships with other high growth firms, we're going to relate those things to firm outcomes. Our key findings are... Well, we document, we document first this kind of fractal structure, so kind of branching structure amongst high growth firms, which we find are split into quite meaningful clusters. Um, we find that high growth firms appear to be getting potentially more differentiated from each other over time. So looking at successive high, uh, birth cohorts of these startups. And we find that originality appears to pay up to a point. But um, it appears that there's better outcomes for firms that are kind of original, but not too original, not too much out there on their own. Um, and it looks like it's good to do something new, but doing so amongst peers. And I think this, you know, actually in the Bohurst data itself, they have these buzzwords, which are kind of buzzy areas that people are interested in. So that's kind of we're kind of looking at that with the text and creating our own measures. So what's our motivation? So. Many of you will be all too familiar with this chart. Um, you know, we have a productivity problem in the UK. Um, we've had particularly poor performance since financial crisis. Of course, there is an international dimension to this um, and much focus on what we need to do to raise growth. A slightly different narrative coming through now, but we are planning on with our work and, and our kind of policy implications regardless. Um, of course, there's a literature from the US mainly showing that high growth firms are a key part of this kind of process of creative destruction where innovative firms are able to grow um, and create long-term productivity growth. We also know that Britain is actually a great place to start a business, but it appears that there are issues in terms of that scale up phase. So how can firms go from being a good promising idea to actually being a big company with lots of jobs and contributing to productivity? And of course, there's been policy focus on this with the government's patient capital review a couple of years ago. So the second motivation is that traditional data sets are quite limited in our ability to understand high growth firms and what they're doing. So typically, if you think of either kind of financial report based data like companies house in Orbis or admin data sets we'll see revenue and employment growth but we won't see much about growth potential or intention or other activities and then also when you're trying to understand what those firms are doing no news to people here SIC codes are not that informative on emerging technologies and here is a quote from the bead review from 2016 the changing structure of the economy means that SIC will constantly lag reality underrepresenting newer industries and overrepresenting ones that are declining importance now, here's a, a simple plot of kind of the distribution of our firms across three digit SIC codes. And you can see there is indeed this massive spike in 620, which is computer programming, consultancy and related activities, and another one in kind of business, other business support activity, service activities. So um, 
even when you break it down to the most detailed SIC codes, you'll get, say, five or six subgroups within that. So that's kind of our motivation. Just to skim briefly over the literature, we kind of are motivated by the literature on the importance of high growth firms and business dynamism, studies from the US, studies done in OECD countries, and some recent work done um, for the Deaton Review and the Economy 2030 inquiry examining these issues in the UK. We're motivated and inspired by some of the literature on entrepreneurship and venture capital, since we're using a data set that can that includes lots of data on kind of equity finance. Um, so there's papers looking at the st strategies of startups and also the strategies of venture capitalists themselves. Um, but basically, we are inspired in our in our kind of methods by the whole work which we're hearing about a lot of today in terms of classifying firms based on textual information. So as I said, Hoberg and, Hoberg and Phillips is our kind of main motivation here um, in terms of looking, they look at competitive dynamics in product markets and firm similarity. There are, there are papers that consider startup strategies. Um, of course, there are many papers and we'll be hearing from Juan today, mapping emerging sectors using website data um, and also technological innovation. So looking say at patents. Um, briefly to talk about the data for those who aren't uh, um, familiar with Bohurst. So this is an organization that has been tracking UK firms that have hit any of eight growth triggers since 2011. So whereas in traditional data, you'll see the scale up trigger, which they also include in theirs. So it's kind of growing your employment or your revenue to a certain threshold, which indicates that you're already growing fast. They also look at various other triggers such as received equity investment. And crucially, this is announced and unannounced deals. So people might be familiar with Crunchbase that kind of takes announced deals. Here they scrape the, um, the company's house data to understand when firms are actually raising any equity finance, even if it's not announced. Um, and a bunch of other things that kind of signal growth intentions, such as you've received a large innovation grant, um, you've been on a high growth list, et cetera. So tracking ends upon exit, either successful or unsuccessful. So successful being IPO or an acquisition, unsuccessful being you basically go out of business. Um, and it's a comprehensive and curated profile. So we'll have the company descriptions. You can see here what we're going to use. It's a web scrape description. Um, also all the financials, fundraising activity and other things. Um, so we're going to be using the richer web scrape description because it's kind of what the company said in their own words. Um, we clean up the text with standard pre-processing steps and we basically get a vocabulary of unique words. So we've got 30, nearly 34,000 firms in our sample, um, a vocabulary of around 94,000 unique words. And there's a word cloud here with like the top 100 of those. Um, so basically, this is going to form the basis of what we do. You can see there there's variation and some firms will be using more words, others will be using less. Um, but the, other, the, other, the caveat to note here is that we are using the data in a static way. We have a snapshot of the company's description when we got the data. And clearly, there are going to be some firms that have changed the description over time. We'll try and get it time by using birth year, fixed effects or cutting by birth cohort. But this is kind of a caveat to the analysis. So in terms of an overview of our methodology, um, with the basic overview is we're going to calculate cosine similarities across firm pairs, which is like thinking about how correlated, how similar are the words that they use. And we're going to use that as a basis of three types of analysis today. So really high level intuition of what we're doing. You start with that vocabulary of words. Um, you get a representation of a firm as a vector with a one if it uses a word at all, zero if it doesn't convert them into frequencies and calculate these similarities. And you'll end up between each firm pair having a similarity between zero and one, which will be higher when two firms are more similar. And this matrix will stack them into a big matrix and that will form the basis of three types of analysis. So first, splitting the firms into a hierarchical clustering kind of um, splits and seeing if these are meaningful, then considering networks, um, competitive network connections, and then finally, um, a kind of new idea, which is differentiation across and within cohorts. So starting with a clustering, um, what we do is run a clustering algorithm. So we're following again the Hoberg and Phillips kind of methodology here, which creates a branching structure, which is kind of why we call it fractal groupings of firms. So we're placing firms, similar firms into 300 bins, which is basically like putting a horizontal line at the point that you get 300 clusters on this dendrogram. Um, and we do this, it's kind of following the, the methodology, it felt like a sensible kind of split, but also because there are 286 three-digit SIC codes in our data, so it's like a fair comparison. 
what you can see here is that some of our key sectors, we saw that key sector 620, are really split or spread across these clusters. So this is a broader view of digital um, technology codes. So we're using the Technation 2018 set of SIC codes, which you can see in the rows here. So around 20% of our sample are in these digital sectors. And you can see that the firms, so the, the darkness of um, in this um, heat map here represents the number of firms. You can see, first of all, there are lots of firms in that 620 code. Second of all, that they're quite spread across the clusters. So it seems like the clusters are giving us some meaningful information for this SIC code, where even with the most granular SIC um, splits, we would get about five or six subcodes. And we show that they're kind of, our clusters are comparable in terms of their explanatory power when we look at some key outcomes. So we've got the R squared here. So our clusters are in blue. Um, orange is the three digit SIC codes, which is kind of a fair comparison here. Um, you can see this is the intensive margin of funding. So it's for firms that have received any equity finance. That's the amount. So it explains a little bit more of that. IPO and acquisition are two outcomes which combine into success, which is the fourth column. Um, and then finally, failure. So failure isn't just to re remember, failure isn't the inverse of success here. It's like going out of business, whereas success is getting those rare kind of IPO or acquisition outcomes. Okay, network connections. What we do is we put all of this into a big network and we adopt a threshold to say that firms are connected with each other. Again, following the methodology that I've referenced before. And in this chart, you can see that there are singleton firms. Those are the ones that don't have a connection as we define it with any other firm. And then the ones in the blue and the ones closer to the middle in particular are more connected. So they have more firms that they're similar to. And we also highlight here 16 unicorns, which were kind of got from a list in 2020 that Bohurst had written up. Um, what you can see, therefore, is that lots of those unicorns are not right in the center. But what we do is we try and formalize some of the measures here and put them in regressions. And so here we're simply counting the number of links that a firm has based on that threshold. And you can see that it seems to be the case that this is all relative to having no links at all, that having some links is a good thing. And the relationship's quite different actually looking at the funding versus the success and the failure. I'll show you the charts which make it easier to read in a second, but you can also see a lot of funding goes into London. Um, this is kind of a well-known fact in the UK. Um, and here, just to say we're controlling for cohort fixed effects and the kind of top sectors, so about 16 or so sectors as defined by Bohurst. But what you can see from this diagram is that for funding, there's an inverse U relationship. So it seems like having one or a couple of connections is quite good for funding, but then there's less funding perhaps going to the more connected businesses. This is probably because venture capital is often looking for something, a, a kind of real opportunity and also often particularly seed finance will be quite spread. So one of the things we wanna do is kind of split the funding to seed finance versus growth finance. But the other two um, areas actually have more of a linear relationship. So it seems more connections are good for success um, and not good for failure. Or should I say good for staying in business? What we then do is try and use the, um, the cohort birth year. So we split the firms by cohort. And here you can just see, we've got that same picture as before, but what's highlighted in red are the firms on the left that were born pre-2010 and on the right that were born after 2010. And you can just see that the ones born after 2010 are just more spread out. So this suggests there's more differentiation over time. Again, we try and um, formalize that with these two measures, which we call originality and trendiness. So originality, it's basically one minus the similarity with the most similar firm to you in the pre-2010 cohort. So we're splitting all these startups to the noughties and the 2010s. And this originality seems to be going up. Trendiness, on the other hand, is kind of how similar are you to the other firms born in the same year as you? And you can see that trendiness on this measure is going down. Putting that into regressions, just like the ones before, so controlling for the same things. Again, we see this the same kind of relationship. There's actually a very strong quadratic relationship between originality and the outcomes. So it seems there's a maximum point, or there's a point of optimal originality if you're thinking about funding, if you're thinking about probability of success and minimizing the probability of failure. So it seems like it's good to be different from the past, original versus the previous decade, to some extent, but perhaps not completely different to high growth firms in the previous cohort. And then it's also good to be in a currently trendy area. And this result is just the trendiness, but it survives when you put the originality and trendiness together. So it seems like you wanna be original from the past, not too original, 
but also doing something that others are doing in your current year, in your current birth cohort. So in terms of conclusions and future work, and sorry, it's hard to put all of this into 15 minutes, um, we find that text-based measures of similarity can form the basis of a number of informative measures about firms, um, about high growth firms in particular. We've just shown some of the outcomes. There are other outcomes we can look at as well. Um, these new measures of originality, we think are kind of a signal of innovation, given that they seem to be related to some of the positive outcomes that innovative firms are seeking. And we find that our clusters are informative. It seems like high growth firms are getting more differentiated over time um, and that originality pays up to a point. So in terms of our future work, there are many ways we can extend this. There are other measures of similarity and network connections we can look at. We can look deeper within those SIC codes. Currently, we're kind of comparing to the three digit level. The other outcomes I mentioned, so innovation explicitly, whether it's patents, we've merged those in, um, grant, innovation grants received, et cetera, and splitting the funding into different stages because the considerations in financing at seed versus growth phase are very different. Um, considering dynamics, as I said, this is quite a static view of the businesses. Um, and finally, another part of the data we, is so far underexplored or unexplored by us, but we're planning on doing it. And this very much links to the diversity topic. Um, we have data on the individuals in these firms, whether they're the directors or the investors. So we can actually explore connections between firms using that other method as well, um, and also look at diversity in that. Thanks very much. Bang on time, I think. Okay, so we take questions from the room. In this room, the lady in the middle. Hi, hi. Um, very interesting talk. Um, I just have one question. How would you interpret the relationship between the similarity or originality with growth? Like, is it causal or is it just correlated? Yeah, so here, obviously, this is correlations. Um, so we're all, so in other work in this project, we've been exploring some natural source of ex exogeneity. So in this space, a lot of the venture capital has been going to software and software as a service businesses. So there's been a massive boom in the finance going to such sectors. And we were exploring some sort of um, the invention of cloud technologies, basically. Um, allowing many firms, digital firms, to enter at lower fixed cost as a source of exogeneity. This has been done in the US. Um, so there are various mechanisms we can use to understand some of the change in certain parts of, of this high growth economy. But currently what we're doing really is documenting correlations, um, very much in line with some of those papers that I referenced where they're looking at strategic positioning and how that relates to outcomes. So, so do we Two quick comments. Uh, one, the dynamic, I think because you're looking at startups, I think it'd be particularly relevant to look at the words when at least they have one paid employee. So they really, uh, you know, because they keep pivoting, they keep changing how they're describing the idea. And, and I wonder if you can separate the self-employed from the ones that really at least have one paid employee and then look at how they describe themselves. Yeah. And the second one, uh, clusters in this case are creating a new definition of industries something that we found that was very challenging but it will test how good your 300 clusters are can you give them a name and can you mm. describe them because yeah. at the end if you want people to use them and policymakers to use them they, they need to be somehow uh, meaningful uh, thank you yeah thank you so actually all of these companies are limited companies so they're registered with companies house um, and usually such companies have at least one employee. They're not self-employed or sole traders. Um, but the other issue is that small companies don't have to disclose their employment figures in, in companies' house. And that's the kind of firm level data we have on these firms. But I think we can certainly, for the, for the firms that we have employment data, we can at least consider heterogeneity. In terms of giving clusters a name, we have done some of that, particularly in that work I just mentioned. We were trying to think, okay, which are... We tried to say this cluster looks like apps, this cluster looks like platforms. Um, so we've begun that work. I think whether we wanna do it systematically, I'm not sure we're necessarily pushing for this to be an alternative to SIC. It's more that we're saying this is 
there's information in this and that can be useful. But certainly, you know, another, another strand of what we're doing across all of this is understanding the net zero economy, where are firms that are relevant for the net zero economy? In the UK, I think, you know, also Juan and many others are doing this and we're collaborating on a new project as well. Um, so certainly there are su some subsectors that it could be very useful to try and name and understand better. Yeah, so thanks a lot. Uh, very, very interesting to, to use this uh, type of alternative data and alternative ways of doing things. Now we've, like regarding the cosine similarity, like we we did something similar a few years back on patenting and the objective was to find out what are some of the really original patents compared mm -hmm. to to others uh, that was a cumbersome exercise but it was an exercise where we then we were very, we were trying to then see to what extent do we then match with some of the you know the top 100 patterns mm -hmm. etc to what extent does this measure of originality mm -hmm. get us to these types of things and it it was challenging so it was it, it depended a lot on what types i mean there were a lot of challenges with the patent data, which might be due because they're written by lawyers, etc. But it depends on what parts of the text you use. You, what you want to get at here is like, what do they actually do? You don't want to get it. Let's say one, some of these companies are hiring some, whatever, a website service who writes them the kind of the the, the text and the and so you get similarities at because of uh, or, or whatever or they they copy some kind of uh, requirements by some agencies mm. etc so there's a lot of things about like what text you use and it's it sounds like it's very different as well that we find it interesting if you can try and link this back to some traditional measures yeah. or to some like saying oh you know our our unicorns they are all actually the the ones who got all the prices for they really are the unicorns they have a good coverage mm. and then then you you kind of you you can you, you go ahead there but i think mm. i think that's that's going to be important and also if you then wanted to be taken up i think that was mentioned by mercedes as well if you wanted to be picked up later on like you want to say well if you look at the traditional some traditional measures and metrics mm. that's exactly what we get here yeah um and 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 probably you'll have to sort out yeah and, and which text you use in particular mm. i think that's like super super critical here in yeah. this type of exercise you don't want something which is just about you know, we are an amazing company in the software industry and we do great stuff. So, yeah, they're all in the middle. But, hey, there might be some who are really original and others are not. So I think there's it's it's a great exercise, but you really it's, it's mm. going into the text and getting getting the right things out. So, I mean, this was a short presentation, but I think backing this one up mm. and making a strong case will then allow you to to yeah. get more. more to be more confident about like what you can then say later on and to run all of these uh, go into kind of causality, etc. cetera, at, at some stage. But I think uh, at least in our experience, we then moved on to other things. So you might want to think of other methods. Eventually, it depends on the size of the data set you have as well, because mm. yeah, the so words in context is I think so the way the, to go, but then it depends yeah. on how much data you have. So there are definitely pros and cons with different types of company descriptions. So many of those US papers are using a, a form and a section of a form that businesses that are listed have to fill in. Um, actually, a benefit of using companies about us page is this is how they want to present themselves to the world. And as you say, that's to try and get customers, but that's kind of what businesses do. They want to get market share. So in a sense, we know that all, all of these companies, they're in the high growth economy. They're ones that are trying to grow and they're active in that sense. So we can assume that they have thought carefully about their about us page. Um, I would say, of course, there, that's going to be different for different firms. Some might oversell, some might undersell. Okay. Yeah, this. sure. All right. So, um, brilliant, brilliant presentation. Thank you. So, so, we'll now bring on Juan as one of the co organizers today. So, Juan's going to present a bottom up uh, industrial taxonomy using web data. Take it away, Juan. Cool. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, it's going to be quite interesting to give this presentation after Anna's because I feel that in some ways we are doing something that is quite original in terms of how we are analyzing text data to generate an industrial taxonomy, but we are generating a taxonomy, which is something that's quite boring. So actually, hopefully, by combining the, the, boring, the, the boring aspects and the original aspects, we can be successful. So... This is work uh, together with Alex Bishop and George Richardson at Nesta. And this is work done as part of the Economic Statistics Center of Excellence. Uh, and basically the problem we are trying to solve here is, is one that um, 
it's basically, I, I feel in some ways, the problem that this conference is trying to solve, which is that we have the economy changing. And we are surrounded by a changing economy in this place. Um, and uh, our ability to be able to measure and understand the economy is racing with like that change in the economy. And I'm trying to represent here in this chart by showing um, in the, uh, ver the vertical axis is change. Uh, and you have like the continuous slope is economic change. And then the change in the steps is our updates in taxonomy. And the shade between both is our gap in understanding where the economy has changed, but our ability to measure the economy has, hasn't changed. So the, uh, the view of the economy are able to get with, for example, an industrial taxonomy that's classifying companies into sectors so that we can look at their employment, the value added, their productivity. We have a gap there. Um, and basically, uh, this gap is maybe not such a big problem when we have a very slow changing economy, like the one I'm representing with this AI generated painting of an agrarian economy. But what happens when the economy starts to change much faster and even exponentially? If we are basically updating our measurement of the economy at the same time, the measurement gap is going to be much bigger and that's going to create an evidence gap in our ability to understand what's going on with the economy and in foreign policy. So the question is, could we use new sources of data and data analytics to clo close this gap, for example, by being able to generate more timely measures of what's going on? And that's what we have tried to do in this uh, analysis. Um, we are using, uh, and basically what we're going to do is use uh, text data about businesses coming from their websites using data from Glass. I'm very happy that Sergi Martorell from Glass is here. So if anyone has like any really deep questions about the data, he's going to be your man. At this point, I'm just going to say that we are working with 1.8 million business websites. Um, they are identified via the IP register. We have matched this with Companies House, which is the UK business register. So that we're able to create a match data set where we have the SIG codes, which is the official taxonomy that's used to um, classify companies. And then we have their description, what they say about what they do in the website. Uh, and we have looked at the uh, coverage uh, of this data and we find clearly sectoral biases. And we find that agriculture is underrepresented, not that many farming, co farming companies have websites compared to uh, digital companies and marketing and things like that. And knowledge intensive and digital are overrepresented. But I guess what we're trying to do in our analysis is to develop a strategy to use the outputs of the analysis I'm going to be presenting in a way that mitigates some of the risks from bias that this uh, bias in the data is going to create. Um, okay, so actually we begin by saying let's test. Uh, if it's possible to predict a company SIG code, the official SIG code using the text description in the company website. We use the most state-of-the-art models like transformers and things like that. Uh, and we find that the model doesn't perform very well. Basically the model is able to use text very well to predict whether a company is a dentist or a company is a hairdresser. But if it's trying to predict whether a company is in a, a professional uh, and technical services or uh, not elsewhere classified sector, it completely fails. It's very difficult to use text to predict those C codes because that category is so heterogeneous and it contains so many different things. And this is illustrated with this like chart here, which is simply showing a, a 2D projection of the company descriptions. So every dot is a company and its position in this space uh, is based on the text in, in uh, its website. And you can see like the blue one is other business support service activities. You can see that companies are all over this space. So actually the descriptions are not clustered in one area, which is what we would expect to find if all of them were saying they do the same thing and doing the same thing. No, we are spread all over the shop in a way that suggests that these sectors, these uh, SIG codes contain many heterogeneous activities that we would like to be able to unpick in some way. And this is what we have done. So uh, having uh, assessed some of the limitations of the taxonomy, then the, the, the SIG taxonomy, then the second question is, can we analyze the text in company descriptions to generate an alternative bottom-up taxonomy? And basically the, the way of thinking about what we're doing here is that we are starting with sectors and we are thinking of sectors as almost like machines of generating company descriptions. Um, and basically some sectors are more likely to generate some terms and these terms appear in descriptions. And basically what we're gonna do is create a network uh, where terms are connected based on how often they appear in the same company descriptions. 
And then we are, we are going to decompose this network uh, using community detection uh, clustering methods. And then we're going to be classifying companies in the clusters to which they belong in terms of their descriptions. Um, and this is using a hierarchical topic modeling uh, algorithm. And if anyone wants to get into the gruesome details of how that works, we can discuss that later uh, or uh, over uh, lunch. Um, one thing that we're doing here is we are doing the clustering inside four digit C codes. So we are basically taking uh, I don't know, 7490 seven, for the C code. We are taking all of the descriptions within there and then we are clustering the companies there. And uh, one of the goals of doing this is A, to do the clustering in a way that's still in some way connecting to the C taxonomy. And also we are trying to almost like control for uh, heterogeneity in the way companies in different sectors use words. Like for example, the term network is going to mean different things in different sectors by doing the clustering inside C codes, we're hoping to, hoping, hoping to account for some of that. But then the problem with doing this is that, um, what if a company is misclassified? We are forcing it to be in a tech sector in the wrong C code. So having done this uh, within C code clustering, then we reassign companies globally within the whole C taxonomy based uh, on the proximity of the vector representation of their description to the centroids, uh, uh, it's almost like the average uh, uh, vector representation of the descriptions in the other C codes. So we have this reassignment. Uh, and a bonus from this is that we are actually then able to, by looking at the distance of a company to multiple uh, C codes, we are able to tag companies with multiple uh, tech sectors. Uh, so we are able to capture the fact that many companies are not really in a single industry, they are in multiple industries. Um, and we haven't done anything with that part of the analysis yet. Um, so what comes out is horrible, uh, and actually this is our attempt at like labeling the, the, the sick codes. We have 1800 of these things, and this is basically tech sectors, and what we have, for example, is the top, top one is 6820 and the score 21. This is the 21st tech sector within that for digit sick code. Um, and this, this is, by the way, not, not cherry pick, this is literally a random list of them coming out from the analysis. I think what's interesting is that you start to see like some almost like the composition of sectors emerging. In this case, you are seeing immigration lawyers, you are seeing people who are installing uh, automation uh, systems, people who are installing heat pumps, which is like a technology that uh, the place where I work, Nesta, is kind of obsessed with. Um, so this is what's coming out. And then basically what uh, we're going to do is I'm just going to show you uh, three examples of how this can be applied. Um, the first one is, we can use this taxonomy to decompose these very heterogeneous sectors. And what this is showing is vertical axis, number of companies in a, in a C code. This is 7490, other professional scientific and technical activities. Horizontal is each bar is one tech sector, yeah? And, basically, and then the color of the bar is representing where within the SIG taxonomy has this company come after we reassigned it. And I think like what's uh, really interesting is that you have companies from all over this place coming into tech sectors within this uh, seed code. And also just the sheer heterogeneity of the, of the sectors here. So we have, what does it say? Coaching, fire safety inspection, tools and software for manufacturing, heating installations, recruitment, health services, biomedical and lab testing, galleries and performance. We have all of that in the same, in the same sector. And by uh, uh, breaking it up the sector in this way, we, we could start to almost like understand it's a heterogeneity. We can also say, okay, actually let's slice the economy in a different way. Let's look, for example, at um, environmental, um, uh, how do you call it, green economy style sectors, because we have the, te the, the, the tech sector descriptions, we can do that. And basically what this one is showing is a bunch of tech sectors uh, that have lots of uh, terms related to sustainability or the environment in their uh, sector names. Uh, and again, as before, uh, well, as before flipping, the, flipping it uh, uh, around, uh, the horizontal axis, number of companies, vertical axis, the tech sectors, and then the colors, where do they come from in the taxonomy? Uh, uh, and, and I think what's interesting here is just the sheer well, the, a, the fact that we're able to do it and we are able to find, 
sustainable housing, solar panels, wind turbines, all sorts of like different like environmentally oriented sectors in a way that we're not able to do the six taxonomy, but also how scattered the across the six taxonomy they are. Um, the third analysis we have done uh, is uh, to actually look at whether this kind of taxonomy is useful to look at the economic geography of the UK. Uh, and one thing that we did in, in one of the papers is look at whether a measure of economic complexity uh, of a local economy based on this taxonomy performs better or worse at, uh, I guess, uh, being correlated with uh, local growth than a measure of complexity based on the um, official taxonomy, and we find that's the case. And then in, in forthcoming work, we have clustered local authorities in the UK based on the sector tax in the tech on the text taxonomy. Uh, in order to look at whether this kind of method can shed some light on the economic geography of the UK and hopefully inform some of the leveling policy agendas, which are obviously in a bit of a policy limbo at this point, but they were very trendy when we did the analysis. Um, I feel like the really interesting thing is that you get this kind of like hippie print uh, map of the UK. Uh, oh, it's gone. Oh, it's gone. Um, and basically the colors are just like the clusters that different uh, local authorities belong to. And I think what's interesting about this is that it's showing us that it's not like you have a, a part of the UK that is all the same color. It's actually the colors are scattered all over, suggesting that you have like um, um, different configurations uh, of uh, local configurations of industry, which are similar across all of the country. Um, we have uh, looked at uh, the association between uh, being in a cluster and various uh, measures uh, of uh, local outcomes. This is this kind of like quite diverse taxon, like like set of indicators on the vertical axis is coming from the own government, like leveling up uh, a set of key performance indicators. Um, and we find that uh, different clusters seem to perform very different in some of these metrics. And for example, cluster eight, which is wealthy and innovative local authorities uh, and boroughs in London and the Southeast, performs very well in on economic outcomes and, and also health outcomes. Whereas uh, cluster zero, uh, which is actually local authorities across the country, but also in the South uh, are less productive and knowledge intensive, perform badly economically, but also in terms of health outcomes, like for example, obesity. So it looks like our taxonomy is able to tell us something about uh, um, differences in, um, in outcomes uh, across the country, which I guess is, uh, is starting to be a bit of a validation of whether it's uh, relevant or not. Um, and just to finish with like, uh, because whenever I present this to colleagues at the ONS, and I'm happy that, that we have some of them here today, uh, they say, okay, how do we implement this kind of thing? How can we use it? And I guess uh, one idea here would be that um, we have, the arrow is just time. We have like change going on and we have like different revisions of like the, and, and we are measuring the economy using this taxonomy that has sections, divisions, classes, subclasses. And subclasses is the four digit C code thing that we have decomposed into tech sectors. Um, it's great, you have this, you, you can do aggregated analysis that are temporally consistent over time using the official taxonomy. But then what you can do is like uh, at different points in time, you can extract tech sectors. And it's almost like create richer uh, uh, perspectives of the economy at the, a high level of resolution in a way like what uh, Anna has been doing, um, do you generate the detailed policy relevant analysis. Um, and actually you can pick and mix. So actually you can decide to focus on those sectors where you feel you have better coverage and less bias in terms of like whether companies in that sector create websites or not. And then you can actually use this information to support reclassification. So because you can see what companies look very likely to be misclassified in a C code based on their text, you can actually be improving the official statistics over time. And then when it comes to revise the, the C codes, you can actually use what's coming out from the text analysis to identify emerging industries that can inform the next re revision of the taxonomy. Um, my, my last slide in terms of uh, how do we make this useful, this horrible thing here, well, I guess horrible depending on where you're coming from, I think it's nice. Um, it's just like a really crude prototype uh, representation of the taxonomy where we have tried to make it hierarchical uh, using clustering. Um, it's a striking and it captures the complexity of this, but it's also opaque, how could you use it? And this is where I feel that there's like a lot of scope to use interactive visualizations that make possible for the further users to actually 
explore these networks, look at what companies are in different clusters, what are the connections between clusters, where are they located and so forth. And this is simply a, a video from a similar visualization using other data that we have developed at Nesta. Uh, and yeah, uh, so this is just everything I said, so I'm not gonna say it again, except that all of this work needs to be done openly and transparently. So all of the code for all of the analysis I have presented here is available in the GitHub repo. So go and have a look if you want to get into the, into the code. And that's it. Thank you. We don't have a couple of questions. Um, this, yes, Andreas. One thing which I, I, I wasn't sure if I understood correctly, you know, do you only assign one SIG code or several? Because many companies have several. I think you could easily use your methodology to attach several. Um, to give like a more granular profile to yeah. each, each company. The the other one, which uh, that's more for clarification, one comment to go forward is, would you try to do, for example, in the timeline is like to assign like a more dynamic reclassification, but I think you can even go a step further and see on based on text-based clusters and dynamics, how the UK economy seems to be evolving, for example, to create actually new classifications, oh, yeah. Yeah. like just, see what what is like the technological technological changes based on your yeah. text data thank you yeah so um around the first question yeah sorry actually i, I just said that it was like a offhand comment and uh about what a i guess like complicated aspect of the methodology basically initially we put every company in a single text cluster because we are doing the clustering instead of the four digit c codes but then once we have done that we basically reassign them across the taxonomy based on, on their similarity to all of the tech sectors. And basically what this does, because we are measuring similarity, we assign them to the closest one, but we have five, 10, like all of the others that are close. And then you could say, actually, I'm gonna tag this one with all of the uh, top five sectors, as long as they are above a certain, uh, below a certain distance and things like that. So we can do that. We haven't used that um, that uh, part of the data in any analysis, but it would be a great extension, uh, definitely. Because yeah, that, then that you start to be able to create maps of relationships between sectors. Is this related to value chains? Is all sorts of like interesting stuff that you could do with that information. Um, your second question that would be amazing uh, uh, to um, yeah, just like create like this longitudinal analysis of the evolution of sectors. Um, I feel like the challenges is um, that some of the instability that you would get over time is going to come from the fact that you're just picking up different descriptions from the company websites. It's not just going to come from changes in what companies do. And it's just going to come from like the, I guess, just like the sheer uh, volatility of, 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 of these models where probably what we would, want, we would want to do is run ensembles of models to generate, uh, to generate outcomes and compare them over time. But I think that's an implementation detail that could be figured out. Um, so it's just like question of just like make it happen. Um, thanks, Pran. Um, it was really interesting to hear how you were thinking about like how do you capture like continuity over time, like whether some of these things will be disrupted and how to make use of them. Um, my question was more about like how do you use this methodology to detect emerging sectors, so sectors where suddenly you see like really like organizations that don't fit neatly into any of those kind of um, kind of sectors. So actually, that's where um, you almost like have a ready made a ready made measure of eccentricity through the method that we have developed, which is what are the companies that you really struggle to assign to any single sectors? They are falling through the cracks of sectors when you do this reassignment. So hopefully that would pick up weird companies and some of the weird will be just kind of losers and just like people who are trying random stuff, which is not going to be successful. And some others would be the, the emerging ones. And I think in order to be able to separate between them exposed, I guess, what you would really want to do which is, I think, like the frontier is to match this data with uh, business registry data. That's going to tell you over time, this company that we have classified in an emer emerging sector, um, what happened to them? What happened to other companies like them? Did they become established? Did they become a thing? Or did they just like, they were just like a one-off and disappear? Thank you. 
Okay, I'll, I'll truncate it there so we can. Uh, so now we've got about 20 minutes um, for coffee and, and then we'll be having our, our next keynote address. So it's theoretically 20 minutes. We might shout to get you in there. Thanks very much. Okay, so we're actually going to continue with the measurement uh, session that we started before, and, and and the reason why we split it is because uh, Daniel is joining us from the US, and if he had been speaking at the time of that session, his uh, getting up time would have been pretty extreme, so uh, he's coming in now. Um, and yeah, Daniel uh, Rock from Wharton uh, is going to be talking to us about uh, using uh, online job ads data to understand the structure of skills and uh, in, in uh, informal understanding of labor markets. Over to Daniel. Thanks, Juan, and uh, you know, thanks to the organizers and uh, particularly Carolina for uh, helping me get a uh, set up uh, for um, this virtual uh, you know presentation. I'm sorry that uh, I can't be there with you all uh, today, but um, hopefully uh, you'll enjoy what I have to show you. All right, so let me uh, get my screen sharing here. Um, can everyone see that okay? Yep. Yes. All right, terrific. So this is work uh, we're, we're calling work to vac for those of you who are having uh, fun with language models yourselves. Um, and we're going to be using uh, large language models to understand sort of the latent structure of the labor market. So this is joint work with uh, Sarah Banna, um, Eric Brynjolfsson, and Seb Steffen. Uh, shout out to Max Fung, uh, who has helped us with a lot of... Um, you know, the, the engineering application. All right, so as a, a big picture, we wanna understand in this project, um, you know, how occupations change. So many different things are happening in the sort of macroeconomic environment. There's obviously new technologies uh, transforming what people do. There's globalization uh, changing where people do things, um, which also affects the structure of jobs. Uh, we've had COVID massively change uh, economies as well. Um, so what we're going to do in this paper is primarily descriptive, and it's about using large language models to generate spatial representations of job posting. So um, one thing you might, or an analogy you might have in your head is that, you know, every type of job comes from some planet, like there's planet salesperson, planet nurse, uh, planet software engineer, and the postings that come from there all kind of have a particular language. So can we compare the language uh, across these different planets and, and see if we can learn something about the overall economy or how these jobs relate to each other? So, you know, if you're going to have one research question in mind as we go through this, you can think about what's the rate of creation of new work? Um, that's an object that there's a, a couple of papers now starting to try to measure it, but uh, there aren't that many uh, that have, you know, deployed uh, large language models or uh, the text of postings to understand that question. Um, why do we want to do this? Well, you know, for one, we're we're concerned about displaced workers. Um, I will say I don't think it's very likely that we get wholesale technological automation of very many jobs. So there's a really nice paper by Dan Gross and uh, James Feigenbaum about how it took AT and T 90 years to automate switchboard operation. That's a really fun story. Um, to, well, fun depending on who you ask, but you know that doesn't mean that there aren't people uh, who will be negatively affected by technological change. Um, and additionally, you know, having these real-time measurements of what's going on in the labor market can help guide better decisions. So it, it's useful that we've got all this data that people voluntarily put online, which is costly to produce and costly to lie about. Um, and uh, yeah, so two goals here. We're going to try to show you some early results, but also kind of promote this as a method, because uh, I think these, as we've seen remarkable progress in AI and ML, it's AI if it's in a PowerPoint, it's ML if it's in a you know Python script, but um, yeah, we've seen remarkable progress on, on AI and ML, and I think that can be deployed for economics and social science research. All right, so um, a few things to, to think about as we discuss this. So you know, different, there's different types of change that you can see in this space. We might expand the jobs frontier, like creating wholesale new work. Um, you could destroy an older area, so automating away switchboard operation, or you could re recombine existing roles to fill in some of the gaps in this space. And we're gonna use um, a baseline model here of BERT, uh, which is sort of one of the first transformer-based language models. It's computationally fairly quick, but you you know, this approach is modular, you could swap that out. 
Um, also to describe a few new techniques here. So let's get into it. Uh, we see a lot of expansion of the job space. You know, if work existed in 2010 or so, it probably exists now, but then there's more things as well. Um, we don't see a ton of destruction. Um, and then there's a few new analytical techniques. You know, there's this question of which jobs are remotable. There are a lot of hand curated ways of getting after that. Um, we provide a means of kind of automatically doing that, automatically generating uh, labor hierarchies and how jobs relate to each other um, and measuring um, what's going on in, in terms of the latent uh, sense. So if you're doing causal inference, for example, uh, for those of you who are familiar with like synthetic differences and differences, which implies a, a factor model uh, for the economy, you can use this approach to generate those factors and create counterfactuals. Okay, so um, there's this really nice paper from a few years ago, uh, the Asimoglu Restrepo framework that if you're deciding, oh, I want to automate folks, um, you know, on the margin, you could give a task to machines uh, and automate it, or you could invest in creating new tasks. Now, if you automate everything, you squish everybody into a really narrow part of the continuum, they compete, wages get driven down. And if you're a really clever entrepreneur, you can come up with a new way to deploy all that work if you can just create a new task that's complementary to all the machines. So there's this natural balance between how much you invest in creating new tasks for machines and how much you uh, invest in creating new tasks for people. That um, you know, that former object, how much we're allocating to machines, has been an object of study for a while. But this this creation of new tasks idea that's that's not been uh, measured very often. There's a, a paper by David Otter, uh, Brian Siegmiller, um, Anna Solomons, and uh, there's one more. Uh, Chin is the last author. Um, you know, so they they looked at job title changing. Um, we're going to look inside the job and see how those change. Um, so we're going to use burning glass technologies. Uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with uh, how burning glass operates. Effectively, they're the online universe of postings. They scrape all all the different postings. The coverage is very good, though of course there's better coverage in some areas than others. I'll I'll skip through some of those details. Some of the more common things, you know, if you just guessed like what posting is it, what kind of posting is this? And you guess nurse, you'd probably do pretty well um, in terms of like, you'd, you'd hit like 3% accuracy or so. Um, so here's an example that I think is somewhat informative for why you need to use one of these transformer based models and you can't use something like word to vec and get meaningful results. So on the left, we've got a senior machine learning scientist for product discovery from Amazon. And on the right, we've got a machinist at Anheuser-Busch. Okay. So, the language used in these two postings is actually not that different in some cases, especially, you know, when you're talking about machines, but they're obviously doing very, very different things. So I like to call this, uh, you know, after some of the examples that Google's provided, like the Monty Python pr problem. If you use word to back or, some, or TFIDF or one of these other methods that doesn't incorporate the context of the word, if we look for Python as a skill, we don't get coding ability. We might get, you know, Monty Python, uh, Chapman, Cleese. These are close by words. Um, or you get things like snakes. Um, and certainly, you know, that can be useful to use this model, but uh, not in our context. We really want to nail, you know, Python, the things that we should see nearby or like C++, uh, Unix, that sort of stuff. Okay. By the way, if people have questions, um, I, know, I think Carolina, you're monitoring the chat, right? Um, or someone in the room. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is build a classifier. Um, we do this for a couple of reasons. We'll get into that uh, in a moment. But the way this is going to work is input is the job text. It's going to go through a few different layers, including a large language model layer. And the output is going to be a vector of probabilities, a logit. Uh, that represents one of 824 different occupations. So we can classify any posting as belonging or originating from, you know, the specific planet or some combo of planets. We might say, oh, it's 25% that came from planet salesperson, 75% that came from planet nurse. All right. So uh, just as a quick thing, you know, we train this model. It's pretty accurate, but the point is not necessarily to get the the, the labels, because the labels are provided to us by burning glass, it's not necessarily a ground truth. So we want to train up into a certain level of accuracy where we're comfortable that it's it's returning something good, but we don't need to train to the point where it's 100% accurate. So our top one accuracy out of 824 categories, we nail it about 80% of the time. I actually think we've done a little bit better here um, than, than we have here. But you know our top 15% 
or our top 15 rank accuracy, I should say, uh, is about 95%. Okay. So why do you want to train a classifier? Well, the first thing is just you need to check face validity that you're actually learning differences across jobs. So if I find uh, you know, a personal trainer, I want to see physical trainer and personal trainer be similar in that space. I want to see a salesperson and doctor be different uh, in some sense. So you learn that uh, that latent thing. You're also going to warm start things for an unsupervised model that we do in a second. Um, then the other thing we can do is what we call a text injection, where we take one posting, we swap out some of the content of that posting for content that we've written to represent a concept. And then we can compare those two postings to build um, an index around that content we swapped out. So I'll show you what that looks like with remote work, All right? Um, what we do is we, we swap out some of the text in all the postings and classify it twice. So the, the text we inject is this is a full-time remote position and employees can be based anywhere in the United States. All right, so we have a posting with that text and a posting without that text. And we randomly put that text uh, in the posting that has it. By comparing how our predictions shift by including that, we get a list of most frequently predicted occupations and least frequently predicted occupations um, on the deltas. So the, the deltas are highest for frontline supervisors of office and administrative support workers, computer network support specialists, um, human resource managers. These are people you expect to be remotable. The one I was kind of unsure about there was food service managers. I looked up what they actually do though, and of their 30 odd tasks, I think maybe one of them um, you know, couldn't be done remotely and that one could be offloaded to a, a subordinate. On the other hand, you know, capital intensive jobs like um, you know, food prep where you're in a kitchen, you're using like some, you know, you have to be local to the food most of the time um, or you know, truck driving um, or you know, kind of high touch uh, jobs that we've seen actually sort of fail uh, to be remoted in the pandemic, even though we tried, like things like teachers, they don't get predicted very often. Um, one person did tell me that truck drivers are the ultimate remote um, workers. I thought that was kind of an interesting spin on that. Um, so, you know, think of this as from 2010 to 2019, what would have been remoted? We're finding those things. And when you correlate those with other hand curated measures, you find pretty positive and significant um, Correlations. We have a few different models here. Uh, don't worry too much about the scale, but it turns out a lot of managerial roles were remotable. Okay, so that's one application that's kind of moving around the space. You can do the same kind of thing, swapping out instead of remote work, you know, skills. So Sarah's uh, job market paper recently does this. Here's a couple of them. You put TensorFlow into a job, you shift towards computer occupations, basically, and away from mental health counselors. That jobs with my experience using TensorFlow, um, and then. Uh, you know, for R and SQL, you'd be, you know, farther away from recreation workers, um, you know, dining room attendants, closer to uh, data scientists and maybe even sales. Okay, so that's useful, but then we've got this, this other um, thing that we want to do, which is to create, um, sorry, one sec, uh, just, okay, oh, thanks, Carolina. Um, so, we want to do something unsupervised too, because spatial representations can't be too close in this uh, in this classifier model. We have to regularize that space. We have to knit everybody together, which involves introducing a penalty. Um, I won't get into the details of how that works, but basically the input now is going to be uh, the job text and the output is gonna be 30 latent dimensions. It turns out there's about 30 different things that move the labor market around. Here's our joy division plot, I like to call this, um, of the 30 different factors. There, there's a normal prior on them, and that's why they're distributed this way. Okay, so what you get is a few different factors. Um, you know, my favorite one here, you can kind of fix the middle. Um, the middle tends to be things like logisticians. They're sort of like the stem cell of jobs. You move from very extreme on one end to the very extreme on the other, and you go from things like, uh, I mean, there's one that's you know, oral and maxillofacial surgeons are in some sense the opposite of dentists, um, or sorry, not the opposite of dentists, uh, the opposite of air and missile defense crews, um, which I found kind of interesting. But, you know, we some of these are interpretable, some of them aren't. Um, what that lets you do is take a look at what we call a factor spectrum across these 30 factors and see how much a job has changed. So here's like commercial pilots, their factor spectrum does not change very much. Office clerks, there are some factors that change a lot, um, over the last 10 years, uh, they, you know, look less like social workers, more like clerks, 
more like customer service, less like IS managers and, you know, away from CEOs. Um, here's logisticians. Um, there's been a few sort of de-skilling uh, logistician factor movements, but um, not a ton otherwise. And then we can look at the overall economy. So here's what 2010 looked like. If you cast our 30 dimensional space into you know, two dimensions, there's this big clump in the middle and around the frontier, there's not a ton. But then by 2015, that clump in the middle is starting to expand towards the frontier, the convex hull. And then by 2019, we've got even more expansion. So if we look at that, um, you know, we, we generate a sampling algorithm to understand how that convex hull is moving. And we found something sort of interesting and surprising to us, at least, that that convex hull, uh, the, every year, first order stochastically dominates the next. Um, that is, we have bigger and bigger volumes of that convex hull every year we go out. Um, and additionally, the variance of that frontier in each one of the samples, that's increasing too. So we're seeing that some of that, not only is the hull expanding, but it's filling in uh, with new forms of work. Okay. so. If we were to measure that and start to think, well, should we worry about automation a ton? Well, it seems like that frontier is growing within occupation at a rate of about four to five percent um, every year, and that rate of expansion has been much higher in the last, you know, five to ten years. Um, you know, earlier on, people were posting more online stuff, so um, you know, we we tend to look at the slower rate of growth. Nevertheless, if you're changing jobs that quickly over the course of, you know, the last few years, then automating all work away is, is certainly a sort of a straw man. We shouldn't be worried about that. Okay. So summary of key findings here, we're going to train this text to occupation classifier, but then also uh, text to occupation variational autoencoder, uh, or just a, a super nonlinear PCA that lets us represent the labor market as a series of factors. Um, we see Pretty heterogeneous changes across uh, different types of occupations and firms. I didn't get into that set of results, but I'm happy to talk about that with folks if people are interested. Um, and then at the level of the macro economy, we see massive expansion in the rate of uh, new task creation, um, which we think is sort of an interesting new measure. Um, you know, we're now in the process of uh, writing up how you can use this for a few different econometric uh, applications, including this index generation stuff, but also um, perhaps causal inference. So um, yeah, thanks very much for your attention. Glad to talk. Uh, now I'll take questions and uh, looking forward to your uh, questions and comments. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, we have some time for questions now. So hi. Um, I didn't understand. You, you said it was a spatial representation, but I didn't see any indications about space. Do you mean space in the sense of geographical region or is it no, no, uh, of space? So this is a, yeah, great question. Um, so this is a latent space. We're going to generate that from, um, you know, so we take our classifier, right? Which you could say, I'm going to take the text and then I'm going to input the text and output a vector of probabilities. Um, that could be a space. Uh, the the probability so we could represent every you know every spot with its vector of probabilities that came from a certain job the problem with that is it's contingent on training um so what you want to do and what we do in this in this paper is we we penalize and regularize um an unsupervised model which puts a what's called a, a variational autoencoder um on that probability vector so uh what that does is it it knits everything together. So if your your distance is, you know, for a classifier, all you need is a, a hyperplane to get in between uh, two categories and you can separate them and you can classify them. For this one, we want not just, you know, easy classification, whether or not there's a lot of distance between the two, but um, for those distances between the different jobs to be meaningful. So uh, this variational autoencoder approach allows us to do that. And then we can compare you know, did the space expand or did it contract? Um, but it's a latent space, not a, a regional one, right? Right. Now, maybe just to follow up on that, you, you mentioned, I think you had 25 fa factors, which I think maybe is what's coming out of your autoencoder. Yep. Are you, are you um, so how much of the variance are you able to capture with 25 factors? Uh, here, let me show you. I'll go back to sharing my screen here and I'll show you uh, how that loss shapes up. Um, 
Well, there's a question of variance of what specifically is uh, the first thing. But all right, so if you look at the, the validation loss, right, by counts of factors, here's kind of how that evolves. Um, what, what, is, what does validation loss mean? What, what is the so, y-axis? So the validation loss is where our input here is that vector of probabilities from the classifier, as is our output. So this is actually a ground truth. You're trying to reconstruct the vector of output probability or the same input and output probabilities. Um, so uh, what you, you well, get what is- What does 850 uh, mean? I mean, just what does the specific values mean? So those values would be like the probability that this posting came from, you know, a sales person versus a, a nurse or something like that. Okay. Uh, Good. So when you try to reconstruct the exact probability vector, uh, your loss drops for quite a while. So if you use five factors, 10, 15, that's great. Um, if you get up to say 30, you know, now your marginal, you know, factor is not really explaining that much. Um, so we, you know, we train that, you, you know, kind of use the elbow method, you know, look at this, the, the kink is around 30. There's another one around, you know, 20 or so. And then we have a, a 10 factor model that explains a bunch, but, you know, once you get out to 40, 45, you don't need to do much more. Thanks. Um, yep. I know there's a lot here. We, uh, <laughs> it's a good. Hi, Danny. Very nice seeing you, even if it's remotely. So, oh, hey, my, hi there. So, my question is broader. I, I sort of want to uh, think about what are the implications of your research for the work from anywhere debate. So, mm -hmm. some companies like Airbnb, let's do work from anywhere. Others are saying no. Some people worry that if we have an economic recession, the jobs are going to be lost, are the ones that are virtual, uh, you know, so what was, from all you have done, what's your view on the work from anywhere? Um, so I'll, I'll say, I think my work from anywhere views are more informed by, um, you know, recent work I've been doing uh, in measuring where it's gone. And, um, you know, we were just looking at some survey results where we track people, the same people over time as they, they switch their work from home behavior. Um, it seems like the very smallest firms, like sole proprietorships, and the largest firms uh, experimented the most with work from everywhere. And there's sort of like this small to medium, um, you know, set of firms that couldn't do it as much, which is sort of interesting to see those that that disparity. Um, I think long term, you know, my guess is things go somewhat hybrid, but there's a the usual separating equilibrium where. Some firms offer it as a, as a way of differentiating themselves. And I think most interestingly, I think there's a, a set of firms that will always be fully remote. Um, and that's gonna require a completely different type of organizational capital to get them to, to work properly. So um, you know, short answer is I'm not totally sure what will happen uh, long-term, but this work uh, at least we'll, we'll hopefully be able to pick it up and measure it a little bit because you can, you can hunt down the firms that are using remote um, as an option here. And I think the the last I saw, I'm gonna say Nick Bloom on his uh, work from home research website had a had a paper where uh, it was 2% of, like you could get a, a 2% uh, wage discount or so on average for working from home, but it, got, it went up to as high as 7.5% for some types of workers. So. Um, it's definitely something people are willing to pay for if they can get it. Does that answer the question? Hi, this is uh, Matt Clancy. Great presentation. Um, if I understand correctly, the uh, latent space is drawn from sort of the universe of postings, but we're not trying to normalize by how many people do each one of these job types. So I'm curious, like uh, when you find that the variety of work is is growing and there's more different types of tasks. Is there a way we can find out if like the actual jobs people are doing are sort of fragmenting or if sort of the whole mass is moving and people, you know, there's a tail of those last positions that were being automated away, but they don't totally disappear or if kind of there's just a big shift uh, across all these new things. Yeah, yeah, great point. Um, so all of what, like you, you mentioned, all of what we've looked at so far is on the extensive margin um, and we're just now getting into the intensive margin as well. So if you weight things by, you know, how many people are in those roles, um, you know, that's a that's a start. But I think um, 
you know, one of the things we're looking at, for example, is uh, how how much variation there is within a role. I mean, the, the dirty secret of all this kind of research is that occupations or job categories themselves are made up and there's no real like, you know, it's something we have for dinner parties or people are like, what do you do? But like the, the boundaries between these things are really blurry. So, you know, we see some interesting stuff though, like, you know, personal trainers, what it means to be a personal trainer has narrowed in like the the distance from the centroid over time has narrowed and the centroids only moved like a little bit. So, um, you know, you start weighting that by how many people are doing the jobs and you see, you know, that standardization of a, a role and, and entry into the role as you get standardization, right? So that's the kind of thing we're looking at. But yeah, great question. That's a, that's a direction we're headed in right now. Hello? Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, I just had a quick question on the selection of the number of factors, but also the regularization that you impose there. Mm -hmm. um, how does the how do you set the level of the regularization, and also does that impact the choice of number of factors, and also the size of this convex hull might also depend on the regularization, might not. Yeah, so we do that through, you know, kind of your standard cross validation um, hyperparameter search uh, process. Um, when you regularize, so the, the penalty that you're imposing is that this is a multivariate uh, normal distribution and that the factors themselves aren't necessarily correlated with each other. Um, the advantage of doing this is, you know, rather than auto encoding the posting itself, you sample from the space instead. So it it knits, you're, you're almost creating, a, you're saying with the with this mean and variance that I got from the posting sample from uh, this space and then try to reconstruct the, the vector of probabilities. Um, and that's how you get that, that regularization, which is kind of nice. But yeah, if you over penalize in that thing, then you're just going to get a, you know, effectively noise. Um, so you have to do cross validation across a few of these things. It does affect, I think it does affect the number of factors, but, uh, you know, within a certain class, uh, you get a, a minimum, uh, kind of a saddle point of all these different things. So uh, we still have quite a few hands up in the room, but uh, I'm afraid we're going to have to go out for lunch and people have uh, Daniel's email. So if you have follow-up questions or things that you didn't get to ask, uh, you can get in touch with him directly. But for now, I guess, really wanted to thank you for an excellent presentation and looking forward to see the next steps of this work. Thanks, Juan, and thanks everyone for uh, for your great comments and questions. Um, you know where to find me. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks.